Hi everyone. We need to continue core four and tackle question 3B. We talk about methane. So it says methane is produced from organic matter in anaerobic conditions without oxygen by methanogenic archaeans. Now that means nothing to you. It will in just a couple of minutes. And some of this methane diffuses into the atmosphere or accumulates in the ground. You say, well, why is that a problem? Because methane is then oxidized. There's your chemistry, the transfer of electrons. So methane is then oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. So when methane is released into the atmosphere, methane is chemically changed to carbon dioxide, and that then alters the absorption of infrared energy from the sun, which then changes the temperature of the atmosphere, which then changes weather patterns and leads to global climate change. So all of these things are linked together. So we need to talk about methane, get you all comfortable methane. You say, well, what is methane? Methane is a carbon bonded to four oxygens, CH4. And methane is what we refer to as a greenhouse gas or a GHG. There are a group of gases that all contribute to global climate change. We're starting to get away from the greenhouse analogy. Um, well, in California, we don't need greenhouses. So when you say a greenhouse to a Californian, they don't know what you're talking about. And so we're getting, uh, this is an older term and we're now starting to use global climate change. It's a much more descriptive term but you will still hear greenhouse a lot. So this methane is a greenhouse gas. You could also say it's a global climate change gas or it's a climate changing gas, fine. But it is a major contributor to global climate change. See, we're just starting to get the population comfortable with CO2. And so now it's time to start talking about methane because there's a family of greenhouse gases uh, and CO2 is but one of them. And so this is global climate change, GCC, right? So people sit back and say, all right, so we're altering the temperature of the earth. What's the big deal? I actually like it when it's a little warmer, right? Well, here's the issue. Global climate change alters or changes ecosystems. Here's the key word, faster. We're changing the climate faster than organisms can evolve in response or adapt. Adaptation and evolution are the same thing. So global climate change alters ecosystems faster than organisms can evolve. Well, what does that lead to? That then lowers their evolutionary fitness until that fitness becomes so low that the organism dies. Well, this causes mass extinction events because if one population dies, then the population that feeds on that population dies and the population that feeds on that population dies and it's dominoes. That's why they had you create the food chains earlier. All of these organisms are tied together. If one species dies, that leads to the death of another species, one after the other. So when we produce methane in the atmosphere, methane reacts with two moles of oxygen to produce CO2 and two moles of water. So while someone sits back and says, ah, by burning this fuel, doesn't produce as much CO2 as other fuels, ah, but methane can be converted into CO2 very easily when it reacts with the oxygen in the atmosphere. So this not only happens when we burn fossil fuels, uh, the beef industry, cows produce tremendous, I mean tremendous amounts of methane. See, you and I are all familiar with methane. Methane is a byproduct of protein digestion. You ever read a lot of beans and you fart, right? Methane, jokingly, is called the fart gas. It's, it's really what it is. So when you start hanging around a lot of cows, I don't know if you've ever been to a uh, cow farm, uh, but the smell is tremendous. And the reason why is uh, the digestive tract of cows produce a lot of methane. And so the beef industry is actually a contributor uh, to global climate change. 
organisms. However, there are organisms called archaeans. These are ancient bacteria. That's what archaean means. Archaean are ancient bacteria. These are some of the oldest organisms on the face of the earth. The first fossils that we have in the fossil record are the archaeans. That's why they're called ancient. We have about a billion years of rock, about a billion layers, a billion years of rock layers. That's a better way to say that. Um, that is nothing but bacteria. The oldest fossils we have, it's not T-Rex, it's not even close, uh, they're bacteria. Now, when you get into bacteria, there's three different kinds of ancient bacteria, okay? There's halophiles. Uh, these live in sulfur springs. But if we spell sulfur with a U. There's thermophiles. These live in extreme temperatures. You say, how extreme? Volcanoes. There are bacteria that live in volcanoes. And then methanogens. And methanogens are called methanogens because they produce methane, CH4. So to talk about these bacteria, what we need to be sure to give you meaning is jump on Google and capture a Google image of these bacteria. So that way it isn't just words on a page. I want you to visualize these organisms. So there are organisms. They are a form of ancient bacteria. They are archaeans, specifically methanogens, that produce CH4. So critics of global climate change will say, no, 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 no. The CH4 is not from the beef industry. It is from all of these methanogens. While I agree that methanogens produce methane, there hasn't been some global uh, bloom, some global spike in the last 50 years of methanogens. Okay, what there has been, though, is a tremendous growth in the beef industry. And thus, we see a correlation between the petroleum industry and the beef industry dumping a whole bunch of CH4 into the atmosphere. Uh, CH4 then bonds with the oxygen and gets converted to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide then captures the infrared energy and leads to global climate change, which then changes weather patterns, and here we go. So that's what they're talking about in question 3B. So question 3C. Question 3C says peat or peat moss. So peat, peat forms when organic matter is not fully decomposed because of acidic or anaerobic conditions without the presence of oxygen in waterlogged soils, things like marshes and bogs, okay, swamps, which of course we don't see a lot in California and Mexico. Uh, particularly, uh, or excuse me, partially decomposed organic matter from past geological eras was converted either into coal or petroleum oil. See, when we're talking about peat, you're like, who cares? Uh, the coal industry cares, the petroleum industry cares, because coal and petroleum are fossilized peat, or coal and petroleum are fossilized peat moss. What we're actually burning, that's why they call it fossil fuels. What we're burning is fossilized plant material from about five to six hundred million years ago. You will hear people say, oh, it's the fossilized dinosaurs. No, it's not. Learn your science. Um, it's the, the carboniferous forests um, from uh, geological time that were then fossilized. And so the CO2 that used to be in the plant material was then trapped in the coal or the petroleum oil, which is why when we burn these compounds, you let the CO2 right back into the atmosphere. Okay, So let's give you some background about peat or peat moss, because, you know, all of us spend a lot of time hanging out in swamps and bogs. <laughs> okay, so 3C, peat or peat moss. We live in much too much of a dry environment uh, to see peat moss in Chula Vista. It just doesn't exist. Okay, so guess what I want you to do? I want you to jump on Google and get an image of this. Get a picture of this in your head so you know what we're talking about. And you say, who cares about this little plant? What's the big deal? Because 
peat, when it goes through fossilization, is what we now call petroleum. That's where the PET comes from. Okay, so petroleum is fossilized peat or peat moss. And people commonly refer to this as oil, crude oil, coal, shale, right? Well, these were plant products. Well, we know that plants capture CO2 by the process of photosynthesis. So guess what petroleum is loaded with? It's the same CO2, the same CO2 that the plants took in hundreds of millions of years ago is right there. And what are we doing? We're digging this out of the ground. We burn it. And so what do we release? We release the CO2 back into the atmosphere. We are returning the atmosphere to what it was about five to 600 million years ago. But we're doing it at such a rapid rate that the organisms can't evolve, not the organisms, excuse me, the populations can't evolve fast enough to respond to the change. Lowers their fitness and then the organisms die. So that is 3C, peat moss. So let's take a look at 3D. 3D says, Carbon dioxide is produced by the combustion of biomass and fossilized organic matter. See, most people don't think of gasoline and diesel as biomass. They don't think of it as fossilized organic matter. That's what it is. That's why we call it a fossil fuel. Let's start connecting all of these dots. And you go, oh, now I see what you're talking about. So, 3D. Combustion. Combustion means fire, explosion, to burn, right? So what we're talking about then is C6H12O6 in the presence of oxygen. You put in enough energy to start this reaction, and what do you get out? CO2, water, and heat or light. You take a piece of wood, you light that piece of wood on fire, you provide some activation energy. You've got a lot of high energy electrons here. Those high energy electrons get released in the process. You release carbon dioxide, water, and heat. You also can produce some light as well. You say, but, but Manro, that looks like combustion. Yep. That also looks like what? Cellular respiration. The chemical equation for cellular respiration and the chemical equation for combustion are the same. The chemistry is identical. Now, I don't want you thinking there's little microcosm fires inside of your cells. That's not the way it works at all. The chemistry on the atomic level is the same, right? When this happens very, very quickly and you release tremendous amounts of heat and light all at the same time, that's fire. Okay, but when you do this very slowly in very small quantities, that's cellular respiration. That's where your body heat comes from. That's why when we do cell resp, you release heat. The heat that's radiating out of you right now is the heat that was trapped as energy inside of those high energy electrons. So they're trying to get you to realize this interconnectedness between combustion and cellular respiration. All right, let's go ahead and go for 3E. I say we go for it. So 3E. 3E says animals such as reef building corals and mollusks have hard parts that are composed of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and can become fossilized in limestone. Calcium carbonate acts as a buffer to cancel the acidity caused by increasing amounts of atmospheric CO2. And then we throw some chemistry at you. So let's go through this. Let's talk about corals and mollusks. So 3E. Corals, or they form colonies, which is a coral reef. So how this works, see, jellyfish and corals are all in the same classification right? And so what happens is you have this little polyp 
I mean, this is a tiny polyp. They're only three, five millimeters tall, okay? They're only like this big. They are tiny. So this is called your polyp. And to protect itself, what this polyp does is it builds this little layer around it, like this. And that is made of calcium carbonate. You know what calcium carbonate is. If you've ever had chalk, right? Sidewalk chalk, board chalk, it's calcium carbonate. It's the same thing that seashells are made of. Well then, when this little coral dies, it leaves its calcium carbonate little tube behind. And then another one grows on top, like this. And then of course you have your little polyp on the inside. Now don't forget, these little guys are only about three to five millimeters tall. Tiny, okay? But then you hear about things like the Great Barrier Reef by Australia, and it's a hundred miles long, right? Imagine building a hundred mile reef three millimeters at a time. Now you start to understand how long it's taken to build these reefs. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, guess what I'm gonna ask you to do? Jump on Google. Okay, I don't want these to be just words on a page. I want you to have access to the pictures. I want you to see it. So, CaCO3, calcium, Carbonate. This is what all shells are made of, whether it's clam, oyster, scallops, abalone, okay, mussels. They're shells. Well, then corals use these this same compound. You go, well, well, why is this important? Well, if you have a water environment, and we are dumping more and more. CO2 into the atmosphere. Well, if you increase the amount of CO2 into the atmosphere, you create an area of high concentration. The CO2 will go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration by diffusion. And when CO2 mixes with water, it makes H2CO3. You go, all right, so what? That is carbonic acid. And we all know what acid does to enzyme activity. Do you, do you remember those curves, right? The optimal curve. And if you get the pH too low, too acidic, the enzyme denatures, it changes shape, and it doesn't work anymore, right? So you say, but, but hold it. The oceans aren't becoming acidic they're staying at a pretty much the, a stable pH. There's a reason why. Because the oceans are loaded with CaCO3, okay? This is the solid. This is what seashells are made of, the mollusks. This is what the coral reef is made of, right? But I don't know if you noticed, but if you've heard the last 10, 15, 20 years, the Great Barrier Reef is shrinking. Why is it shrinking? It's dissolving. Why? Because calcium carbonate reacts with the CO2 that's diffusing into the ocean and the water to make calcium H bicarbonate, like this. And this is a liquid and it's neutral. So the good news is you have this beautiful buffer. A buffer keeps conditions even, keeps conditions constant, okay? So the beauty is that the ocean has a tremendous amount of calcium carbonate, okay? But this is a fixed amount. So what's happening right now is as more and more CO2 gets dumped into the atmosphere, this CO2 is going into the ocean. And the ocean, the pH, is changing just a little bit, not much, okay? 
well, how is it possible that all of this CO2 is going into the ocean and the pH of the ocean is not changing or it's changing very, very little? Why? Because the CaCO3 is dissolving to react with the CO2. But what happens when the CaCO3 levels get too low and they, you basically run out of CaCO3? Uh, well then what's going to build up? What's going to build up is your carbonic acid. And what you're going to see is a dramatic drop. In ocean pH, in marine pH. Well, if you take the marine environment and you dramatically drop the pH, what's going to happen to all the enzymes? The enzymes of all these organisms are going to denature. The enzymes are going to stop working. What happens to the organisms? They die, all right? So this scenario is referred to as ocean acidification. And it is another drawback to CO2 getting dumped into the atmosphere. But people don't take it seriously because they say, oh, the ocean's fine. Look, the pH is fine. It's, it's, it's fine, it'll be just fine. And the biologists and the marine biologists and the, and the chemists and the oceanographers are jumping up and down saying, hey, there is not an infinite amount of CaCO3. When these values get too low, you're going to see a crash. And when that crash happens, we are all in a lot of trouble. So don't get bummed out about this. Don't get, oh, look, the, the world is ending. Mm -mm. What do we need to discuss? We need to discuss the politics Link to that little gas right there. We need to talk about what we're going to do about CO2. We need to talk about our energy consumption. We need to talk about our economy. How are we going to produce less CO2, but still have an energy source and still have a successful economy? That's the discussion we have to have. Do not let this graph bum you out. Don't go, oh, the world's, it's just over. I'm just gonna give up. Absolutely not. It's the opposite. We don't need to give up. We need to have more discussions. We need to have discussions about biodiesel. We need to talk about this and the solution needs to come from my generation and your generation working together. We can't wait for your children to take care of this, okay? Our grandparents and great-grandparents created the problem and we need to address it, all right? So let's get some work done. So that's question 3E and that wraps up topic three. Then we'll be off to topic four.